It is in the curious nature of man to build things as much as it is to destroy them. But through the centuries, man has found that building things is a learning process. When engineers do something new, uh, it's very possible that uh, they'll miss something. And this, this has happened, and this has sometimes led to failures. But paradoxically, all of my experience, uh, times when failures occur mostly is uh, not when new things are being done, but rather when old things have become rather blasé and engineers have become rather complacent. Man first built things on the earth, taming it with massive monuments to himself. Then he turned to the sea and finally the sky. We have filled libraries with learning since those early days, but still we try to tame the land and the sea and the sky. Still, sometimes we fail. Watching the shining triumphs of the space age and the seeming ease with which man now leaps into the heavens, it's easy to forget how hard it was to take those first early hops. In the early part of the space program, we were really pushing the state of our science, and those failures were, I'm going to say, fairly bought. That is, when you're going out there and trying to push a design into new territory, you're going to have a lot of failures because you just don't. Early rocket pioneers were groping in the dark. They had no textbooks to refer to. They were writing the textbooks. They faced every kind of problem. Once you develop finally a rocket, uh, the motor, the big problem is how to fly that sucker. It's not only just true that you have to guide it also. The metal rocket nozzles where the fuel is burned melted because the temperatures were too high for the alloys of the day. The rockets had no guidance systems, no control systems at all, so they flew erratically when they didn't just blow up. Explosions were common because the fuels they were experimenting with were highly unstable. In the beginning they just experimented with chemicals from uh, our point of understanding nowadays it's just extremely dangerous but they just didn't knew better um, they were just pouring liquid oxygen into a, um, into a tank and uh, it was extremely dangerous by the 1930s two giants had emerged Robert Goddard a secretive American rocketry genius and Werner von Braun in Germany two men two countries in conflict but they shared a dream to put a man on the moon an impossible dream, but little by little they were making it come true. But Dr. Goddard was far more than a dreamer. And all we have seen in the space program ever since, up to the big Saturn V rockets that carried our astronauts to the moon, can be traced back directly to Dr. Goddard's dream and his early pioneering feat. Von Braun and his team gained wide experience in Germany during World War II. That led him to develop the world's first space vehicle, the V-2 rocket, that bombarded London, Holland, and even parts of Germany. But not before he was arrested after a long string of disasters. Small failures usually end up in a very big failure. And uh, if one little piece is not exactly at the correct place, the whole thing can blow up. And um, you don't know why. After the war, von Braun and his team came to America. But the large, complex new rockets they were asked to build made their small, simple V-2 seem primitive. With the new multi-stage rockets, all the old problems were multiplied. Finding powerful yet stable propellants, developing metals that would resist the tremendous heat of the burning fuel, and controlling the rocket once it launched. Disaster followed on disaster as rocket motors and control systems melted on takeoff. Second and third stages ignited prematurely and fuel leaked or destabilized and exploded. The rocket's putting its thrust here. The center of mass is way up here. It's what we call an inverted pendulum. That's a proper pendulum. That's very stable, always points down. This is an inverted pendulum. And, you know, we all know some of our friends can exert the control necessary to keep that upright, that's the rocket problem. 
After the Russians launched Sputnik, the Earth's first artificial satellite in 1957, one U.S. senator called for a national week of shame. To make matters even worse, America's answer to Sputnik was this rushed launch of a Vanguard rocket. But von Braun had President Kennedy's confidence. In the 60s, the tide began to turn. Von Braun's huge new Saturn V rockets were the only series ever built with a perfect record. Every one of them launched flawlessly. Twelve years after Sputnik, Americans were walking on the moon. They got there riding Saturn Vs. Rocketry experts say that if von Braun and his team had gone to Russia instead of America, that would have been a Russian leaving his footsteps in the moon dust. Zero. Then at the end of the century, just when space launches seemed routine, America developed trouble with its workhorse Titan IV rocket, its main vehicle for launching satellites into space. Within eight months, three launch attempts in a row failed. All three failures took their super expensive satellite payloads with them. Cost over three billion dollars. It appears we've had a problem with the vehicle. Biggest problem with rockets is um, once there's a failure, it just blows up and you have bits and pieces and you can't build it together. You don't know exactly what happens. Uh, all indications are here, there's not coming back. Europe's rocket, the Ariane, launches satellites 12 to 14 times a year with a high rate of success. So what was going wrong with America's rockets? You get an answer to that, you'll make a fortune over at Lloyd's. They go in the tank 350 million every time one of these things blows up. One answer is clear. The race to the moon is over, and space is a different game with different realities now. Here you have an industry that's, that's probably got the best and brightest of the people in the country as far as technical terms. They've got the, uh, and they're dedicated and they're hardworking, but they're trapped inside a system uh, that is not dedicated to getting things done right. Nowadays, they have to look for money. They have to outsource. They have to um, make things better and cheaper. And most of the time, it works just fine. And sometimes, you have to pay for it. Throughout history, the same hands that build and lift have also been turned to the engines of war. When we devise machines to kill the enemy, an engineering disaster can turn the stream of destruction against its creator. Such was the case in World War I with a gun called the Shosho, a French-made light machine gun issued to American troops in Europe. It soon became infamous as one of the most disastrous weapons ever produced by anyone. The selection of the weapons was not done by the military people. It was done by the political people. World War I was a turning point in human history for many reasons. For one thing, the Great War revolutionized the machinery of death. Death became mechanized, impersonal to a degree unknown before that time. The main reason, the machine gun. When the American Expeditionary Force landed in Europe in 1917, part of the process of integrating into the Allied armies in France was arming the Doughboys. Most American units wound up with the light portable machine gun made in France, but paid for by the Americans, the Shosho. This is absolutely the, the worst thing ever inflicted on the American infantry, this magazine. You notice that it's cut out. We didn't do that. That's the way it came. And uh, you can imagine in the trenches, mud, dirt, and whatnot getting in there and filling this thing up. And it, this was just one of the many problems. If you fire it, it would give you what the French called the slap. And, and quite literally, you, you could break your cheekbone with, with the weapon. Another huge problem was the fact that the gun was manufactured so badly 
that no two were exactly alike. That meant that you couldn't swap pieces and make one gun out of two in the field. The reason you can't take parts off one and put it on another is that it was shoddy workmanship, shoddy material. It's just bad. It's just really bad. American troops faced the German army with its horribly deadly Maxim machine guns. Most Americans who were issued the show show simply threw it away and looked for something better. I interviewed an old gentleman once uh, who was equipped with it, and I asked him if it was any good, and he said, well, the only thing that was good about it was you could take the parts off and make a still. The incredible irony was that the American army did indeed have its own machine gun, the Browning Automatic Rifle, or BAR. The BAR was such a superior weapon, it was still the main fire weapon for the army and the marines 50 years later. Why didn't the Americans over there get BARs in 1917? This was such a good weapon that the decision was made that if it fell into German hands, the Germans could produce this and use it against us. To keep the BAR out of enemy hands, the decision was made to keep it out of American hands too. The British had a good machine gun that could have been used by our forces, but our troops were also denied the Lewis gun for political reasons. The British had their nose out of joint uh, in that uh, Pershing refused to allow American units to be integrated into the British Army. The Brits wanted American replacements into the British Army. Pershing refused, and they insisted then that all the production of Lewis guns go to the British. There's no way of knowing how many American lives were lost because the troops were issued an inferior weapon at a time when the best machine gun of the war was in the arsenal, unused. The show show rifle automatic weapon really is a, a, an engineering disaster because it, it can be counted on to fail at the worst possible time. I know that this thing would jam when I really, 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 really need it. The giving out of, of armament orders and the building of the different ones has got nothing to do with uh, what, what works and fight wars and everything like this. And it, it's all a matter of politics and, and rewards and things, and that was why you got those awful guns. Next, on more engineering disasters, at the height of the Cold War, silent, deadly hunters prowled the bottom of the sea. America's finest submarine still lies there, crushed by the deep, the Thresher. The 30-year Cold War between the U.S. and Soviet Union led the world to the brink of nuclear war and also forced technological advances in a number of fields. In 1963, the brand new nuclear submarine, the Thresher, was the fastest, quietest, deepest boat in the American arsenal and that made it the best attack sub in the world. You were riding in the baffles, you know, of a you know, of a, a Soviet submarine, and the Soviet sub didn't even know you were there. You know, a, uh, a senior chief that I interviewed once down in Kings Bay, Georgia, says, you know, back in the Cold War, we went to sea, and we owned them. The battle for undersea supremacy is deadly serious. Nuclear missile subs called boomers are the most destructive weapons ever created. America's Cold War boomers carry up to 24 intercontinental missiles, each with multiple nuclear warheads. A single sub carries enough firepower to completely destroy any country on Earth. Silent, hidden, they can strike anywhere without warning. In many ways, they are what they were in the 60s, the ultimate weapon. The common currency in submarine warfare is silence. The person who betrays his location first is probably going to die first. The main defense against boomers is the attack sub, like the Thresher. The attack subs designed to find and kill boomers were vital to the security of both sides. The most modern materials, the most cutting-edge techniques, went into each new series. So in the case of Thresher, you have a submarine that's the best we ever did. It was a, it was a magnificent ship in every, in every possible way. Uh, she was quiet, she was deep running. Because of her speed, she could be a bear submerged. Because, again, they're on the cutting edge. This is a fast ship going very deep. Thresher was built in Portsmouth, New Hampshire and launched in 1960. After her first sea trial, she was brought back to the yard for a refit. 
cracked welds and a number of other defects were repaired. With the kind of pressures that exist deep below the surface of the ocean, the build Builders and the Navy both knew how vitally important every weld was. You had to have a master welder laying down that bead of, of, of weld to make sure that the uniformity, right, the consistency, the quality of the weld is extraordinary. Only a sample of Thresher's welds were checked during construction and after her sea trials. Then she put out to sea again, followed by the submarine chaser Skylark. She would dive to her maximum depth in a series of steps, then return to the surface. The actual maximum depth is still classified, but as soon as Thresher reached it, something happened. Just after nine o'clock, right, Skylark got a transmission from Harvey, the captain, who said, if I remember, if I can paraphrase it properly, that he was experiencing what he called minor difficulties he had, uh, posit he, had, he had positive buoyancy at an up angle, and he was attempting to blow. It was a transmission that haunted naval investigators for years. A minor difficulty at maximum depth, and blowing the tanks was an emergency measure, a last resort. It meant forcing compressed air from flasks into the boat's buoyancy tanks to make her lighter than water so she could float upwards. But normally, with a nuclear power plant, you simply drove the boat to the surface. If you do an emergency blow at test depth, you're going to come up like a cork. Right? And it's very, very difficult to control the ship at all. Now, Skylock's wondering what in the world attempting to blow. After the first transmission came some garbled words. Skylark's crew waited in growing horror as the silent seconds ticked by. Meanwhile, at the bottom of the ocean, the Thresher's captain must have seen what was coming. The sub drifted deeper and deeper, helpless, without power, without the ability to surface. He could do nothing but wait as the boat sank deeper and deeper until finally crushed depth. Over the underwater telephone aboard Skylark came the unmistakable sound of a submarine being crushed by the immense pressure of the ocean. The men aboard were killed in a fraction of a second. It was an engineering disaster that rocked the Navy to its core. A salvage vessel recovery, uh, which is on the scene, uh, cited an oil slick. So I conclude with, with great regret and sadness uh, that this ship with 129 uh, fine souls aboard is lost. What probably happened was one of those silver braised joints gave away. Now, if you're down at test depth and you even have a minor fracture on a silver braised joint, the water's going to come through with the power, you know, of a, of, of a pressurized water cleaner. It'll, it's going to blind you. It's going to be very, 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 very difficult to find what the source of the casualty is and how to contain it. As with most large engineering disasters, a whole string of unlikely events had to occur at the same time to destroy the Navy's finest submarine. With all her problems, even with her nuclear reactor shut down, why couldn't Thresher simply blow its ballast tanks and float to the surface? The Navy tested the question on another sub, the Tenosa. What they found out was remarkably instructive. The valve system through which the compressed air had to pass in order to get to the ballast tanks was not only very narrow, we would expect that, it also had a cage-like device over it that allowed the air as it passed to leave behind any particulate matter, any dust or particles or whatever. When Tenosa tried to blow, she got a complete hard coating of ice on that little cage and it stopped the blow. He couldn't blow. At maximum depth with the nuclear power plant offline and leaking, that was the final straw. The Navy had discovered the final link in the long chain of events that ended in disaster. Without the ability to blow its tanks and surface, Thresher's last hope was gone. Two deep-sea submersibles later found and photographed the wreck of the Thresher 8,400 feet below the surface of the Atlantic. There is wreckage strewn along the bottom, including a piece with her hull number on it, 
Amazingly, the conning tower seems in perfect condition. Meanwhile, the Navy continued to ponder what could have happened. No one has actually seen a submarine implode, but experts believe it doesn't flatten like a crushed soda can. Rather, water at 80,000 pounds per square inch punches a hole into the boat and in milliseconds it blows through every partition inside. The boat itself retains most of its shape because the pressure inside and outside is equalized so fast. The men don't have time to drown. They never know what hit them. Next, on more engineering disasters, ugly, cheap, and slow, they carried the weight of the world across two oceans, America's Liberty ships, floating trucks with a deadly flaw. The story of men in the sea is longer than human memory, and often in history, the fate of nations has been decided on the decks of ships. But perhaps never before was the weight of the world carried by a small, slow, ugly, unarmed floating truck like the Liberty ship of the 1940s. Ships born with a disastrous flaw. Liberty ships won the war for us. They were not meant to be pretty. They were meant to help save England. And uh, they did. Lieutenant Commander Robert Montgomery and Captain Clark Gable are here as Irene Dunn smashes the traditional bottle against the ship's bow. 441 feet long, built of steel and capable of 10 knots on a good day. The cheap, simple Liberty ships were America's answer to fighting two wars across two separate oceans at the same time. One of them, uh, built by Kaiser, I believe, was the keel was laid day one, the basic hull was put on day two, the uh, accoutrements, the accommodations, all the things that went with it, day three. Uh, the engine was finished day four. The ship was launched day, day five and went out with a full cargo. And the story is that when Hitler heard that, he said, we lost the war. Couldn't sink him fast enough. The tried and true riveting system was just too slow for this. But the early welded Liberty ships developed a bad habit that sent shivers along the waterfronts where sailors gossiped on piers and earned the ships the nickname Kaiser's Coffins after the shipyard where hundreds were made. They had a tendency to break in half without any warning at all and sink within seconds. It was an engineering disaster. Welding was brand new. It had never been done on any great scale before and here we were planning to weld the largest fleet of ships that ever built in the world by anybody. And so there were some that had a weakness right at the, right where the bridge began, about halfway down the length of the ship. Right at the forward end of the house is where the uh, cracks would typically happen. It was almost explosive. And I believe uh, the, the speed of a crack traveling is something like 3,000 feet per second. I mean, just boom, and it's over. You got two pieces of ship. Seven Liberty ships broke in half and sank, most in the frigid waters of the notorious Murmansk Run, above the Arctic Circle. Forty more ships had major damage. Testing proved the welded construction basically sound. Ships had been built on a smaller scale using welding for years. There had to be another answer. It was found that when metallurgy tests were done, when the steel used in the ships, the Liberty ships in particular, which wasn't the highest grade steel production in the war uh, because they weren't designed to make but a, a voyage or two, uh, when steel was placed down to that temperature, it became extremely brittle. The frigid temperatures weakened the steel's internal structure, just as it did on the Titanic 30 years before. And the weakened steel intensified the strain on the wells it was a deadly combination. The design flaw was terrifying, but the fix was simple and effective, if not pretty. A three-foot-wide band of steel was riveted along the ship, reinforcing the hull and holding her together. After that, there were no more catastrophic breakups, and the Liberty ship went on to do her job. If we didn't have a Liberty ship, the war would have lasted much longer. England would have been completely uh, defeated, 
uh, subjective, and Hitler would eventually have attacked America over here. He would come to us, attack us on our own shores. A staggering 400 Liberty ships were sunk by the enemy as they fought to prevent this. In the end, the repaired Liberty ships simply overwhelmed the enemy. America was just building them faster than they could be sunk. Ten years after the war ended, the age of jet travel was still beyond the horizon and the world continued to travel by sea. In 1956, one of the world's great luxury liners carrying 2,000 souls from Genoa, Italy, bound for New York, was rammed broadside off the coast of Massachusetts in pea soup fog. The other ship was a cargo vessel with an icebreaker bow, the Stockholm. The uh, Stockholm ice reinforced bow penetrated 30 feet into the Andrew Doria. As a result, uh, when the uh, Stockholm backed away, the uh, gaping hole in the side of the Andrew Doria caused the Andrew Doria to list the starboard. The Andrea Doria went to the bottom 10 hours later. Only 51 of her passengers were killed. Did the great ocean liner have to sink, or was her destruction really an engineering disaster? The Andrea Doria was only three years old. At $29 million, including $1 million for original artwork, no expense had been spared in her construction. But under her shiny skin may have lurked a fatal flaw. The Doria carried fuel in long parallel tanks that stretched along either side of her hull. Transverse pipes between the tanks were designed to balance the ship as the fuel burned off during a voyage by flowing fuel from one tank to the other, keeping her level. After the accident, the Doria was listing 18 degrees, making any kind of control nearly impossible. In the late 50s, a controversial book called Collision Course claimed that if the transverse pipes had been usable for emergencies like this, fuel could have been pumped from the low-lying tanks into the higher ones. Then the ship would have floated more level in the water and could have been saved. I, too, had read Collision Course. I had uh, read the fact that uh, when the Stockholm uh, uh, penetrated into the Andrew Doria's fuel tanks, five on the starboard side were, were breached and five on the port side were intact. Uh, so the water flowed into the starboard side tanks and if she was ballasted properly, port and starboard side tanks, that uh, she wouldn't have sank. Uh, and it was plausible to me. Captain Mern doesn't find it plausible anymore. Since divers have found the Doria's keel was broken, a usually fatal injury to a ship. But beyond debate is another tiny engineering flaw that was almost certainly at the heart of the disaster. Since the war, radar had become commonplace on all merchant vessels of any size, but operators weren't always at home with it. Radar was still fairly new at that time. And uh, there was a phrase that's still common today, radar-induced collision. It meant overconfidence. Captain Mern and many others believe the Stockholm thought the Doria was 12 miles away when she was only two miles away because the radar's rain setting was not visible on the darkened bridge. Thinking they were avoiding collision, the two ships actually turned directly into one another's paths. In those days, uh, the, the controls were not illuminated. So when you change the radar range scale, unless you had a flashlight to illuminate it, you don't know which range scale you were on. After the Andrea Doria disaster, all radars had their range settings illuminated. The transverse fuel pipes might or might not have saved the Doria. But experts agree that a 10 cent light bulb illuminating the Stockholm's radar range setting probably would have. Coming up on more engineering disasters, Buildings have come crashing down for as long as people have put them up. But how can modern buildings in the United States simply collapse? In Hartford, Connecticut, a light snowstorm fell on the night of January 18, 1978. A routine matter in a New England winter. But those four and a half inches of wet snow were the straw that broke the camel's back in an engineering disaster so colossal it was hard to comprehend. In downtown Hartford is the new Civic Center in its arena, the replacement for a massive structure with a fatal flaw. I assume in other parts of the world they may have had bigger 
disasters, but, but this was a very large structure. I mean, size-wise, it was 300 feet by 360 feet. It was a huge, huge structure, and, uh, and, uh, and it came down. The arena had stood for six years under an advanced space truss roof design, second largest of its type in the world, and considered an engineering marvel. Less than five hours early, Earlier, thousands of fans had cheered a hockey game. Yet that night, under the weight of the wet snow, the roof suddenly folded and crashed onto the seats below. That was one of the first designs that was uh, made relying very heavily on the computer. It was uh, simply uh, too complicated to, to calculate using the old methods of a slide rule and hand calculations. This was exactly the problem, that it wasn't braced properly to form this kind of a buckling shape, what we call the S-shape. It formed this kind of a shape. And it takes much, much less force to buckle it. And uh, believe me, when the load came uh, on the structure uh, at uh, 17 pounds of snow, uh, it, it, just, it just did and it buckled. Computers were still new then, and engineers were not as familiar with them as they are today. In this case, the engineers' complex computer-aided calculations were correct. The mistake came in transferring the computer's results into plans the builders could use. The bracing system for the 30-foot roof members was all wrong. They thought it was bracing it at its midpoint, uh, at the 15-foot uh, point. It was a big mistake, an obvious mistake, and it slipped by everybody. The problem showed signs or showed itself at construction but no one recognized it they had tremendous amount of problems in trying to put this thing together the parts didn't seem to fit even though they were fabricated precisely so the contractor simply forced things into place and for six years the building stood it really takes a major blunder to have a major disaster Structures, uh, structures are very forgiving uh, for one reason or another. Structures don't really want to come down. Uh, they are redundant. Uh, they tend to stay up. Uh, they take a major, major blunder to have one come down. If we make a mistake as a structural engineer, uh, it's not like uh, you're going to sweat a little bit because the room gets hot. It's uh, not to take anything away from a mechanical engineer, okay? But if we make a mistake, uh, you could kill people. This is not an isolated incident. Other collapses during and after construction here in the United States have occurred in recent decades. The award-winning Kemper Arena roof in Kansas City crashed down seven months after the Hartford disaster, also onto an empty arena in an engineering disaster where weakened bolts failed during a rainstorm. The human factor you will never eliminate. I don't really care how much sophisticated computers we buy or we get or we use. The human brain of the engineer overrides everything at the end. The Los Angeles Aqueduct, constructed from 1907 to its official opening in 1913, brought water from the High Sierra Aquifer through a string of artificial reservoirs connected by giant pipes and canals 200 miles across the desert to Los Angeles. It allowed that small city on the coast to grow into a megalopolis. The massive project was built ahead of schedule and under budget by architect William Mulholland. Without the aqueduct, there would be no Los Angeles as we know it today. But there was a human price to pay for all that speed and economy. Part of the aqueduct project was a dam and reservoir system, including an artificial lake created by a gravity dam in San Francisco Canyon, 45 miles northwest of the city. Built from 1924 to 26, the dam had been full for two years, serving as terminal water storage for the city of Los Angeles. Though it was leaking badly, no warnings were given. And just before midnight on March 12, 1928, the St. Francis Dam burst. Twelve billion gallons of water were released into the canyon. 
A wall of water, 125 feet high, roared downstream, and 450 people below the dam drowned in their beds. It was the worst man-made disaster in California history. Documented by this historical recreation and footage from the Department of Water and Power. The dam is located at, over to my left here. It uh, span from the point I am at, which is the right abutment or west abutment, across the canyon to the left, which was the uh, left abutment or east abutment. Little remains of the dam in this canyon today. Nothing marks the spot where concrete once stood 185 feet high and an artificial lake flooded this entire valley. When the, the reservoir started to fill, the, the water would percolate into the sides of the hills on each side of the dam, and it became saturated on the old landslide plains. And so at a point in time when the friction there wasn't there, then it started to move down and cause that left abutment to give away, causing eventually the dam. So it was sort of a sequential operation. Critics say the massive loss of life was caused not by flawed geology, but by Mulholland's personality. The dam had been leaking badly, well before it collapsed. In fact, locals were so concerned they brought the great man up there just one day before the fatal disaster to see for himself. Mulholland was called out to the dam the day before it failed to inspect what was significant leaking before the actual release of the, the dam occurred. And he assured everybody there that it was fine, this was normal leakage for a dam, which of course it was not. The St. Francis Dam collapse forced a set of laws designed to prevent such an occurrence again. William Mulholland himself was devastated by the tragedy and spent the rest of his life in seclusion. It's certainly possible that a very small uh, factor can trigger a uh, whole cascade of, of other factors that can lead to a disaster. Never has this been more true than in the great Northeast blackout of 1965. While it took years for engineers to figure out exactly what happened, the fact was that for half a day the entire Northeast region of North America went dark. Phones worked, battery radios worked, but practically nothing else electrical did. The great 65 blackout I think was the wake-up call really to the nation of the interdependence of the power grid. It happened November 9, 1965 at 5.27 p.m., the height of rush hour. LaGuardia and Kennedy airports were paralyzed. Thousands were trapped for the next 13 hours in elevators. Operating rooms and hospitals went dark. Traffic lights. Subway trains filled with almost a million commuters. The entire city shut off. Unbelievably, it all started hundreds of miles away in the North Woods. At a power substation near Niagara Falls in Ontario, a small electrical relay similar to a circuit breaker overloaded and kicked off when it shouldn't have. Later it turned out the relay was marked as having been upgraded, but it had actually been overlooked. That small event triggered a massive chain reaction. The whole thing started very close to here. There was a, uh, an appropriate action of one of the protective relays over there, uh, one of the power swing relays, which tripped, causing other devices to trip, and it was a cascading event. The nation's power grid is fully interconnected. Each substation has automated circuitry and devices designed to protect itself and its equipment from a power fluctuation occurring elsewhere on the grid, a fluctuation that could destroy its giant generators. Any sudden change in the input or the power source driving the generator or in the output, which is the amount of power a city draws, can unbalance and destroy a station's generators. All substations are designed to disconnect from the grid in case of a sudden problem that endangers their generators. As we take and receive a signal from them, when they trip their breakers, they trip our breakers, and it just keeps going. The shoebox-sized relay that tripped affected the Sir Adam Beck substation on the Niagara River, which was operating at near maximum capacity at the time. The relay shut off power in one of the station's five power lines, sending its 1.5 million volts onto the other four lines. That was far more power than they could bear, 
so their breakers trip to protect themselves. Toronto went dark. Suddenly there was huge extra power in the system. It flowed back across the river into northern New York. Stations there couldn't adapt fast enough. They began to trip off too. Uh, what we had at that period were uh, uh, transmission system control systems that just couldn't react fast enough to that situation. And we also had utilities that were uh, uh, stretched in, term of their, in terms of their generating capacity. So as a result, you had a domino effect across, the, uh, um, across Northeast America. The blackout began to spread. Buffalo, Syracuse, Albany. Within minutes, the whole northeastern region of North America was brought to its knees. Rumors spread faster than the blackout. It was the bomb. It was the Russians. There are some people that claim UFO did. I'm serious. Some people said they saw a mysterious red light. Minutes later, the only system still online for 30 million people was Consolidated Edison in New York City. The Con Ed manager had an agonizing choice. Disconnect from the grid and keep New York City lit, or stay connected and try to power the entire Northeast. He chose the latter. It was a noble effort that was doomed to failure. Twelve minutes after it began in that distant forest in Canada, every light in New York City winked out. New Yorkers took the crisis in stride, huddling around transistor radios by candlelight. Nine months later, hospitals were reporting a higher than normal rate of births. Where were you in the blackout, people would ask each other. To this day, those who were there still remember. We had a cascade of, of, of various units in the power grid, all of whom were doing what they were told to do precisely, which is protect themselves from destruction. But of course, the net effect was that they shed all the load to the northeast to make sure that they didn't, weren't in fact destroyed by a power overload or a power uh, surge that they were not designed to handle. So in some sense, we designed a system that did exactly what we told it to do. Because of Con Ed's heroic delay in isolating itself from the grid, its generators suffered massive damage. Con Ed was the last major system to come back online. New York City had been dark 13 hours. Although the computer has brought significant improvement, the national power grid is still vulnerable to massive outages. And the biggest problem is that the way the outages happen, and consequently the ways to prevent them, are still not fully understood. Now I'd like to represent to you that 35 years later, we now have the grid designed as a system with system-wide monitoring and control so this can happen. Wrong. I like to think of engineering as the avoidance of failure. Uh, all of the designs that, that engineers try to produce are basically uh, designs that will not fail. Major disasters are rare. And the reason they're rare is so many things have to line up for them to happen. And if any one thing doesn't line up, you don't have the disaster. Mankind will continue to build monuments on the earth taller and thinner and more ephemeral than ever before. And he will continue to try to conquer the sea, tame the sky. And once in a great while, our engineers will try something new, and it will fail. Or they will do something well known, badly, and it will fail. But things do fail. And if the exact right set of circumstances aligns at that precise instant of failure, a disaster will result. It has always been that way.